Hi, today I would like to welcome you to a tutorial video to show you how to uh, process LiDAR data from the Cube 240 with uh, a Planix uh, Postpack and the Cloud Station software. Before we uh, start working with the Cloud Station software, and especially when you start the Cloud Station software for the first time, I would like you to check for the settings. In the upper left corner, you can open the settings and you can, uh, you can switch uh, between, the, between these uh, windows here. Uh, the first one, the general, is um, to enable mouse wrapping, then you can allow the network settings and of course you can set your preferred language. Uh, the second one is for the license, so uh, of course you need to activate your license. Uh, for this computer the license is already activated and when you receive your Cube 240 and the software you will find a document explaining to you exactly how to activate the license. Uh, next here there is the, um, um, the browser for the right uh, LiDAR calibration file, so every single Cube 240 comes with its own LiDAR calibration file, which is actually named like the serial number of your, of your LiDAR. And you have to uh, use this file and to browse for the file and put it here into the cloud station to um, use the right calibration values for the both side angles. Then we have another one for extraction. Uh, here you can set the minimum laser range, uh, for example 20 meters. Uh, this is especially useful um, very close to the UAV. You might hit some dust in the air or some, uh, some objects like insects or birds and that might create some, uh, some artificial uh, points in the air. And to prevent that you can set a minimum distance of 20 meters. That means all points closer than 20 meters to the UAV will be will be deleted automatically. Uh, last not least, there are, is a system setting and I would uh, recommend to enable your, your better graphic card. For, for example, here I activated the GeForce RTX 2070 for OpenCL processing. Once the settings are done, before, before we start opening the project, I would like to show you the data which we are uh, using today. So we are using uh, today uh, three files which comes from the, from the Cube 240. From the USB stick there is a yellow scan file, a TO4 file which we will later use with the Postback software and there is a, a Libox file. And of course there are a couple of Rhinox files, uh, especially the O files and the N files are needed to do the post-processing. Uh, of course, we could now open the raw data directly with CloudStation, but then the data would not be post-processed. Therefore, I minimize the CloudStation window for a moment and I open the Postpack software. And I would like to show you how to use the Postpack software to do a first uh, PPK processing of your 3D trajectory. Once the software is open, um, or once the software is ready, um, we start by clicking on New Project. And we just use a template and an empty project will be created. Here on the left side you can see Mission 1 is our empty project. Next we click the Import button and we will have to specify the path to find our data. The data for this tutorial is on my SD drive and I called it um, Flight Free Tutorial and in the Flight Free Tutorial folder we should see a couple of files. All right, now we have to go in in a subfolder, there's a yellow scan subfolder in the tutorial file and then we can see all the files. So again, here's the Libox file, the TO4 file, the yellow scan file and a couple of Rhinox files. First of all, we load the TO4 file by importing the TO4 file and then some processes are running in the background, which you just uh, monitor and watch.
So there are some checks are going on. The IMU data is checked. And then the software is checking for GPS ephemerides uh, from Chimble and some other companies. Uh, some are available, others not, and it will automatically download the right data needed. So no action required. We just watch. And these windows will close automatically after processing. Okay, this is the flight path of the drone. So here we have the, the takeoff. We are flying to the, to the calibration pattern and then uh, towards the first waypoint and then left, right, all the runs. And at the end, it's flying back to the landing location. So next, what we need to do is we will have to load the, the Rhinex files. So we again activate the, the mission tab here. We click import and we now select uh, all the O files which are the Rhinex files, and we import. Okay, um, uh, once this is done, we have to open the mission on the left side, and we, uh, we, we search for the base station, and we uh, open the base station, and we do a right click on the base station, here on the Alpha Kilo 1, we do a right click and we go to the coordinate manager. This is important to set up the right coordinate system for the base station. So now here, um, assuming you are using a Rhinex file from an official base station like a Trimble, Leica, Topcon, whatever base station, the station information should be accurate enough and there's no need to change the, the coordinates. For the case uh, you have been using the iBase and you know the exact position of the iBase, you can switch to decimal degrees and you can, um, you can change the coordinates, the latitude and the longitude and the altitude to the correct values. This is quite important to make the absolute accuracy right. If you would not do this, the relative accuracy would still be okay, but there might be a shift of 50 centimeters or even a meter in any direction because the iBase can't uh, measure its own position with an RTK or a PPK accuracy. But this uh, data set is from an official Trimble base station, so we don't change the latitude and longitude. We just check for the for the frame, even the antenna uh, information is correct, so we, ch we check for the frame information. Uh, preset is the ITRF00, and for this specific location, we would change it to ITRF2014. And the epoch uh, for, the, for the position of the base station is the 1st January of 2010, ellipsoid uh, WGS84. Once we are happy with all the settings, we apply the changes and we close the window again. So finally, we do another right click on the, um, on the base station here on the left side and we set this to be a base station. So set base station, we press this and now um, it's, uh, it's uh, calculating the accuracy for this, uh, for this uh, Rhinex file and the overlap with the TO4 file. So then after this process, we will directly see whether we have a 100% fixed solution or a 90% fixed solution and 10% float solution. This is the, um, the result of this, of this process. So 99.17% fix and 0.83% float. That's pretty, pretty good. And we uh, close the window by clicking OK. So this is the moment I would recommend to save the project, uh, just in case the, the software is, 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 is crashing or something is happening, um, to not necessarily do the, the steps again. So I save this to the same uh, directory. Let's just go to Flight Free Tutorial and ca I call it Postpack Flight Free. So now um, we could uh, jump into this step direct directly um, if there would be an issue. And now the final step to process the, um, uh, 
the PPK trajectory is we click on the GNSS inertial processor and we just click run. So this will now take a moment. Um, while this is uh, doing the, the processing, you can monitor the accuracy here. And there are some, uh, some results displayed on the right side. And actually what we can expect is a one centimeter, two centimeter, three centimeter uh, PPK average accuracy. And uh, once the process is uh, completed, the last step is to export the SBAT file a text file which we will later need in the cloud station software. So processing is done. Um, we, can, uh, we can now see that there are, um, there's a second um, trajectory which is displayed in, in, uh, in a green color and a magenta color. So the processed one is the, is the, is the, is the magenta color now. And uh, we can also see the baseline distance uh, between the takeoff point and the base station. So last step, tools, export. Uh, we are here already in the, in the right format. We would like to export an ASCII file, all records, ellipsoid height, only the post-processed coordinate output in meters, uh, let long in um, degree decimal. And finally, we just have here to uh, specify the right, the, right, um, the right file name. I would, put it, I would recommend to put it in the same folder where all the other raw data is located. And uh, what I usually do is I call it uh, SBAT3, for example, here S, SBAT3 to immediately understand it's the, the SBAT file for the third flight. And we just click on save and finally don't forget this is just specifying the name finally you will have to click on export which is actually doing the export if you miss this step there will be no file in your directory export so now the the SBAT file is actually written and then we are done with postpack quite straightforward and easy and then we are ready to process the data with uh, Yellowscan Cloud Station software. So now we are back to uh, Yellowscan Cloud Station and first step is to open the project. Um, well, we are in the right directory. Directory flight, free tutorial, Yellowscan folder and we open the Yellowscan file. And uh, then we should immediately see the runs. So these are the runs which are automatically uh, detected. Uh, we can of course uh, modify them or we can delete all of them and create our own runs. To create our own runs we just um, select a run by clicking on it and uh, it will suggest a length and we can modify this slightly by moving the slider on the, on the lower part of the screen to make it straight and we would not like to process the data in the turns. So let me just for today select uh, three runs, one, then two, this is the second one, and um, okay, and the third one. Okay, we have three runs. I'm not processing all of them just to save time in this tutorial and uh, well now I'm happy with these runs and um, now we check the settings we have uh, this is our yellow scan file the PPK, the PPK solution is already correct it's the SBAT3 file the one we processed with the with the postback uh, the set reference is the postback elevation so it's ellipsoid height and we have the right calibration file we are using the full field of view, minus 35 degrees left to plus 35 degrees to the right. And so we can start the processing by hitting the, the play button.
So the raw data processing is, is done. Um, we can with the mouse wiggle, we can zoom in and out um, uh, to this point cloud. Uh, we can hide the 3D trajectory here with the show trajectory button. Uh, so let me hide this because this information is not relevant anymore. Uh, we have here in the top, we have a wheel where we can press to the west view, to the east or uh, to the north. Um, so we can uh, change the field of view and we can of course use the mouse to, uh, to rotate, to rotate the, um, the point cloud uh, and to move the point cloud. Now I'm rotating it and I'm zooming in and I can move it and we can here see the, the road and we can uh, zoom in here to the road structure and uh, yeah. There are some more uh, nice tools here on the, on the left side. There is an EDL which is a kind of a shading effect. You can enable and disable. I usually like this effect and you can make this effect more uh, harder and softer. So actually uh, this is up to you whether you want to see more terrain details or less terrain details in this uh, first quality check. You can change the point size uh, from small points to, to large points uh, depending on the, the few distance and uh, we can colorize the point cloud by many many different um, parameters. So for example, uh, the echo where we can uh, change between the first, second and third echo. Um, so we can here only look at the second and third echo or only at the first and third, first and second and so on. Um, we can look to the maximum echoes. We can check for the classification if it's already done, not yet. Uh, we can uh, look for the stripes, so we see nicely see the overlap of the data. We can we can check for the intensity values. These are the intensity values of the of the lidar. So even if you would fly the lidar at night, you will see you would see the the texture, and you can use this slider here to do a contrast stretch to see much more details. For example, here in this open area, you can see some some darker areas probably a uh, uh, result of driving cars and here brighter areas. The brighter the area the more reflective, the darker the area the less reflective uh, the lighter signal or the, the, the surface. So this is uh, a nice tool to, um, uh, to check the data quality. We can uh, also colorize by scan angle and by GPS time. If we select the elevation, you can also use this slider to, uh, to change the, the color ramp in the lower part, in the blue part, and in the red part here on the right side. Okay, so that's pretty, pretty all you can do uh, at this, uh, this stage. The next step would be to process the um, strip adjustment. Therefore, we uh, should click here on SA, like strip adjustment. And there are two methods for the strip adjustment. Uh, there's a robust method, which is uh, quicker and a precise one, which is slower, but more precise. And the precise one is especially the right one for the Trinity because we are flying very long runs. And especially on long runs with, a, with an IMU drift, the precise method is the one which is recommended to uh, improve the alignment of the point cloud in the overlapping area, especially for the long runs. For those who want to uh, use ground control points at this stage, uh, you can check this box, uh, use ground control points, and you can load ground control points in, uh, in UTM and uh, ellipsoidal height. And these ground points will also be used to anchor the point cloud and adjust the point cloud uh, to make um, the match better and the final result a bit better. Um, I, I rarely use this option, um, especially because of the reason that I can't, usually can't provide uh, ground control points. For example, for this data, there was no chance putting ground control points in most parts of the area because it was populated by vegetation. So precise, and then we just hit the 
process button and this will approximately take as long as the flight time. So we selected about uh, three runs. So this should take probably something like, um, like 10 minutes or 15 minutes to do the processing. For a one hour flight, it will take approximately one hour and for a 30 minute flight, 30 minutes. Okay, this uh, process uh, has finished and as we can uh, see, the accuracy has been improved from a statistically 13 centimeter noise to a 11 centimeter noise level. Um, this is not very representative because uh, in this uh, specific flight there was uh, so much uh, vegetation, so most part of the area is covered by trees and there is not a really good improvement for the match. Uh, this works much, much better on flat surfaces, on roads, on uh, big concrete uh, areas, on flat areas where the, the, the matching algorithm between the point clouds um, can be much more improved. Okay, I close this report. And we will not really see a huge difference in the, in the point cloud right now. Um, uh, it's just an overall improvement, which you can later see in the, in the entire point cloud when you inspect the point cloud with some cross sections. So finally, um, um, the last step in this tutorial video is how to produce the classification, the ground point and the vegetation point classification. Therefore, we go to this module called terrain. And here we have a limited uh, number of uh, parameters. So let's first start with the kind of terrain we are looking at. Is it a flat terrain here or is it hilly? or even steep or extreme steep uh, terrain like in the mountains. Um, in this uh, area, I would say it's a gently rolling hills uh, environment and uh, therefore uh, we select a hilly. Uh, the minimum, minimal object height here is the height uh, which we would uh, use as a minimum height for vegetation. Um, here I actually would like to do something like um, you know, 20 centimeters and the maximum object height is the highest tree in the area. I would say this is probably not more than uh, 35 meters. So 35 meters uh, maximum object, 20, cent 20 centimeters smallest object, uh, point cloud thickness is an automatic value taken by the, by the software from the overall statistics. And uh, now we are ready to hit the classify button and this will again take a while and uh, then we can check the results. Okay, the terrain classification has been uh, successfully completed. Um, as we can see here, now we are looking, uh, we colorize the classification. So the orange um, points are vegetation or any non-ground points, while the gray points are the ground points. And now if we scroll down here, uh, we can change here between um, unclassified ground and other. So for example, we can, we can keep the ground points activated and we hide the other points. And this uh, will show us the non-ground point, uh, the ground points only. And uh, if we now increase the point size a little bit, we can see that we nicely get points in the forest. Well, still kind of enough points if we zoom in here and we again um, show the vegetation so we can see that there is uh, 
plenty of, uh, of ground points and non-ground points. What you also can try is you can go back to elevation. So you colorize by elevation and um, we can now hide the, hide the vegetation or the, the non-ground points. And uh, still we can now see the ground points and you can play a little bit with these, uh, with these settings. You can check for the intensity values and you can see the, the non-ground points and the ground points. So it's, uh, there's lots of, uh, um, or lots of tools to visualize um, the, the data. So finally, last step is uh, to export the data. And to export data, uh, there's another, another button here on the left side, uh, the export button. And here you can uh, select whether you want to export a point cloud. So point cloud or a digital uh, model. We will start with the point cloud. You can uh, specify the point cloud uh, format. I would uh, like to export an LAS file. So 1.2, uh, for example, LAS 1.2. Uh, we can give it a name, so we call it, let's say, uh, flight 3 and then it will number the runs um, and then you have the choice whether you want to export the point classes, which I would recommend uh, you to do. And of course, you can also merge the stripes to one point cloud or you export them separately as single runs. As single runs. Uh, I usually export them as single runs and later in, for example, in Cloud Compare, I, I merge them together because sometimes it's quite nice to have them individually to, to clean them up, uh, to inspect them for, for noise or for, uh, inspect them for, for some um, objects you want to delete like cars or whatever. And this is sometimes easier um, uh, if you operate it, if you process one one uh, run by run instead of having the entire point cloud. So once we are happy with that, we press the export button and the point cloud uh, is exported. Um, this again takes a few seconds and then I would like to show you how to export the terrain model directly out of the Yellowscan cloud station. Okay, export is done. So next uh, we select digital model and we can do the export as a surface model or as a, um, as a terrain model. Actually, you would like to have a, a terrain model and a surface model. I would like to export both of them. Um, we can generate a hill shade. Uh, typically, I would do a unidirectional hill shade, um, which is the standard one. And then we just uh, again click export and the data will be written to an export folder under the yellow scan uh, main directory. So remember there was a directory called uh, flight free tutorial and below this there's the yellow scan uh, project directory and inside this directory uh, we will then find an export folder with all the point clouds with the LAS files and with the terrain files. So this was the last step. Uh, let me show you the final results. Um, we uh, press through the right folder. We go to the free flight free tutorial, yellow scan folder, export. And here you can see the free LAS files. And we have the, the DSM and the DTM TIFF file. And of course, uh, we have the, the hill shades. And for example, if you look at the DTM hillshade, um, you can see this is uh, the hillshade um, with, the, with the holes and of course, of course uh, we can uh, create a hillshade with later with the cloud compare software for example or with TerraSolid which is a watertight uh, terrain model without any holes. Okay, now I would like to show you um, in, another, uh, in another short uh, step how to produce a watertight terrain model without any holes. So, of course, we have some, some settings here as the pixel size and the maximum hole size. And if I, for example, change the pixel size here, 
to a to a one meter pixel size and the maximum hole size to let's say um, to let's say 70 meters it will probably create a watertight terrain model without any holes so let me just export again Yeah, so now with the one meter cell size, it was uh, much quicker than uh, with the 50 centimeters before. And now let's uh, check again, let's check again the results. So now the terrain model is uh, watertight, so there are no more holes and we can see that uh, this works quite nice. I hope you enjoyed this uh, short tutorial video. I was recording the video in one go, so it's really uncut and it's just a short uh, um, video to help you to get started with your new equipment with the LiDAR Cube uh, 240 and you hopefully uh, find it really easy to process the data with the Postback software and the Yellowscan Cloud Station. Okay, hope to see you soon. Have a nice day. Goodbye.